Okay, so uh, we're going to have an extra lecture on dualities and equivalences of field theories. And um, so basically I'll formulate what duality means between two field theories and I'll give some examples. Okay, so, so what is a duality or more generally an equivalence of field theories? So first uh, kind of answer, so first of all, what, what is a field theory? So for us, a classical field theory was given by a space of fields and an action function on that. So the first uh, kind of classical answer uh, this just means that the spaces of classical solutions are equivalent. Let's say you have two field theories and you look at spaces of classical solutions in the first field theory and it's isomorphic to the space of classical solutions in the second field theory. Um, okay, so that, that's, that, that's a reasonable definition, but it's, it's way too weak. Namely, you, you can have some theories which definitely don't look the same and they're not equivalent in any sense, even though the spaces of classical solutions are equivalent. Okay, so this is not a good answer. Um, another answer is on the quantum level. And I will not formulate it precisely, but roughly speaking, you want to say that um, expectation values in both theories are equal. So in particular, the partition function in both theories is the same. So Z is the partition function. Okay, and this is uh, the approach I'll take um, today in terms of the path integral. Um, but um, in, instead of going through the whole formalism of the path integral, I'll just formulate it axiomatically what it means for two theories to be the same and um, show that some, some field theories give examples of that. Okay, so let's, um, so basically I'll list three, uh, three types of equivalences between two field theories. So let's say you have F1 and F2, two spaces of fields in some field theories, and you have S1 and S2 are the action functionals. And so what, what does it mean for, for the theories described by F1S1 to be equivalent to the theory described by F2S2? Okay, so here's the first type transformation. Um, so suppose that um, the space of fields for the first theory is given by a product for the space of fields for the second theory and some vector space. Okay, so that's the first assumption. The second assumption is about the action functionals. Um, so the second assumption is that the action functional for the first theory is going to be this, the action functional for the second theory. So this is just a function of two. Uh, plus some additional term where f is going to be just a function on v and it's assumed to be a non-degenerate quadratic form. Uh, 
Okay, so, quadratic, so basically this means that in coordinates, you can write it as a quadratic expression with non-zero coefficients. Is it visible? Um, I... Like in black, okay. Um, okay, so, uh, so this is the assumption. And then um, I say that F1, S1 is related um, to this theory of 2S2 via transformation D1. So I'll have G, three types of transformations, D1, D2, and D3. So this is the first kind of transformation. So again, if you have, if, if your action functional is some other action functional plus quadratic form, not the general quadratic form, you can get rid of the quadratic form. Okay, so that's the first um, transformation. So I'll comment on them uh, later. Let me just write them down. So the second one is basically the same assumption. So again, uh, you have F1 is going to be F2 cross the vector space. And the action functionals is going to be S2 plus a pairing of alpha and V. Um, so here, Okay, so first of all, um, alpha. So alpha is a is a function from f two to v dual, and v is just a coordinate on v dual on on v. So al alpha paired with v just means a linear function on this vector space v. Okay, so this is the assumption. So again, the, the first type of transformation is you had a quadratic form. The second type of trans transformation is where you have a linear form on this vector space. Okay, uh, using that, let me define a new type of theory. Um, so F2 prime is going to be the zero locus of alpha. So just alpha inverse of zero and S2 is the restriction of S2, so S2 prime is the restriction of S2 on the zero locus of alpha. And then I say that F1, S1 is related to F2 prime, S2 prime, using D2, let's say via D2. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll give yet another um, type of transformation that I'm allowing here, uh, but let me just state an obvious proposition. So suppose that you have two theories F1S1 and F2S2, and they're related by sequence of transformations. Um, D1 and D2 then there are spaces of classical solutions. Are equivalent. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so if you have a quadratic form, then you, you take the derivative of that, it's going to give you a linear function and you want that to be zero. That means that that component has to be the origin if you want, want a critical point. So that goes away. Similarly here, um, if you want to find a critical point of S1, let's try to find variation with respect to V. If you want a critical point, that means that alpha has to be zero. So that's exactly what uh, F2 prime is doing. Okay. Um, okay, so, so th this is the, the two transformations which are more or less obvious. Now let me give one more transformation which is less obvious, um, uh, which has a quantum origin rather than this kind of classical. Also one thing, when you say that F1 is equal to F2 times B, this is up to isomorphism, right? Yeah, so uh, just, yeah. And then I suppose that the second statement is up to what's the division of this isomorphism? Yeah, so, so S1 is a function of one, you put it on F2 cross V, and S2 is a function of two, and alpha comma B is a function of V. Okay. Um, okay, so here is the third uh, type of transformation. It's getting worse and worse. What, what do you think about the green? Is it still visible? Okay. Let me try the green. Okay, and now suppose that you have um, F1 is F2 cross some lattice, so Z to the M. Uh, sorry, uh, F2 cross R to the M cross Z to the M. Um, so here I'll call coordinates AJ and here the coordinates will be NJ. And the relation between the action functionals and again, as Rick said, this is just an isomorphism here. Uh, the relation between the action functions is, is the following. You have S1 is going to be S2 plus two pi i, the sum over a, j, and j. So, so here, um, I'm slightly changing the notation. Uh, S2 is going to be a function on F2 cross R to the M to R and not just on, on F2. Okay, uh, then, um, then you can consider F2 prime, which is F2 cross Z to the M. So this means that AJ is an integer and S2 prime is the restriction of S2 on this F2 prime. And again, the claim is that then F1, S1 is related to the theory defined by F2 prime and S2 prime via D3. Okay, so, so this is a little bit more intricate uh, because here the space of classical solutions of the two theories are not the same, but I still claim that the path integrals in the two theories will be the same. And it's related to the following statement. Okay, so. So the 
space of classical solutions are different. Uh, but on the, on the quantum level, the path integrals will be the same. And it's related to the following formula, which is called uh, the Poisson summation formula. Okay, so this states that if you have a sum over, in, over the integers of e to the 2 pi i times a times this integer, then the sum in the sense of distributions is the same as another sum. So this is sum over m being the integers of delta functions. Okay, so this is known as the Poisson summation formula. There are various ways of writing this, but this is the easiest way. So in a path integral for this functional S1, you're going to have integration over this z to the m, which just means the summation over all n, over all n j's. And in the measure, you're going to have e to the 2 pi i times a j n j. So using this Poisson summation formula, you get rid of the integral over n, and you just see that you, you can replace that integral, integral or, over n by just setting a, a to be some integer. So this is exactly what happened here. A was an arbitrary real number, but then in F2 prime, it became an integer. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, so now um, you have these three transformations. And the final definition is a, an equivalency between two, two field theories. Um, so I say that F1, the theory defined by F1 and S1, is equivalent to the theory defined by F2 and S2. Um, if it's equivalent, well, if it's connected by a sequence of transformations. D1, D2, and D3. So D1, D2, and D3 generate some equivalence relation on the space of all field theories, and um, th that's the equivalence relation that I'm talking about here. Okay, so now let me get to examples. Unless there are any questions about just the, the setup. Well, this D1, D2, D3, a bit arbitrary to me. Is there like a good reason to distinguish these specifically? Yeah, so. so Again, in the end, he won't um, the two. In the two theories, he won't the path integrals to be the same, so expectation values to be the same. D one, which is inter um, which is where, where where you add an an, ar an arbitrary quadratic form, this is just the fact that you can you, you can compute that integral. That's the Gaussian integral. So th that's one thing. Then um, D two is linearity. So then you have an integral over linear function. So let, let me maybe comment on this. So on quantum level, so D1 is related to the fact that if you have integral of a Gaussian, uh, well, it, this is equal to something like square root of al pi over alpha up to some factors. So you know how to compute this if alpha is positive, if alpha, let's say, is positive. And so you can just get rid of this, um, 
up to some factor. Yep. Um, in the second one, you have e to the, um, let's say, um, a, a x, and this is going to be the delta function of a. So integrating over some linear function corresponds to just setting that variable to be zero. That's the D2 transformation. And as I already mentioned, D3 transformation is that if you have the sum, so you have your path integral over F2 cross Rm, and then you sum over all Nj's, you have your original action functional plus two pi i Nj Aj, you use the Poisson summation formula on, on this 2 pi i and j a j to rewrite this as integral over the same e, sorry, this was s2, s2, and then there's going to be the sum over all mj of delta functions. So the, therefore, this integral, the, the original path integral becomes equivalent to the path integral. So this delta function just enforces you, enforces the condition that all ajs are integral. So it's that kind of transformation. Okay. All right, so let me begin with the easiest example uh, of Kalman theories. which is classical mechanics. So classical mechanics is the easiest example of field theory. Um, okay, so let's say um, I consider the following kind of theory. So F1 is going to be the mapping space from the real line into R to the 2n. And um, let's say the coordinates here will be denoted by p1, q1, p2, q2, and so on. So just the usual coordinates um, on R to n, equipped with its symplectic structure. And then the action functional will be the following, the sum over all i, or let's call it j, pj, qj dot, uh, minus pj squared over 2mj, and minus some potential. So here mj are just some real numbers. And this is, the, this is the action of classical mechanics. So you have PDQ minus the Hamiltonian for classical mechanics. Okay, so this is, uh, if you like, this is a Hamiltonian approach to classical mechanics. So this is classical mechanics. in the Hamiltonian formalism. Uh, okay, uh, here, let me just say B is a function from R to the, to the M into R, just the function of the Qs, uh, R to the M. Okay, now let's look at classical mechanics in the Lagrangian formalism. So it's the following kind of theory. You look at, instead of maps from R into R to the 2n, you look at just maps from R into, into R to the n. The action functional 
is going to be the sum over, over j's mj qj dot squared over 2 and then minus v of q. Okay, and this is classical mechanics in the Lagrangian formalism. And now I claim that these two theories uh, are equivalent. So this gives you an equivalence of Lagrangian Hamiltonian formalism. Okay, so how do you prove that? So F1, 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 S1 is equal to F2, S2. And I claim that this is via uh, transformation G1. Okay, so how do you relate these two action functionals? Well, it, this is not difficult. So here you have pj squared and you have pj. So you can try to complete the square. Uh, and you're going to get exactly s2 plus, um, let's see, pj sorry, like this, 1 over 2mj. Pj minus uh, mj qj dot squared. Okay, so let's check that. First of all, we have an extra v, v of q in both of them, so let's ignore those. Um, in S1, you have, let's put a minus sign then. Okay, in S1, you have minus pj squared over 2mj. So that's the first term. Then when you expand the square, you're going to get minus 2pj mj q dot j. 2mj will cancel. You're going to get th this term. And then there's going to be a term which is the square of the last term. And it will cancel with this uh, square in here. Well, and now if mj's are all non-zero, this is a non-zero quadratic form. Uh, so it's a non-zero quadratic form, not of pj, but of pj prime, which is pj minus mj qj dot. So I can, of course, um, shift my variables instead of my variables being pj to variables pj prime, which is this difference. And now this last term doesn't depend on the, on the coordinates qj anymore. And you can just integrate over that or apply transformation d1. OK, so that's the proof. OK. All right, so let me give another example. Um, this is an example of a classical just a uh, free scalar field. Okay, so let's say M is a closed oriented Riemannian manifold.
So it has the associated Hodge star operator. And it has the associated Laplacian. So um, an easy consequence of the definition of the Hodge Laplacian, so let me recall that the Hodge Laplacian is given by uh, up to a sign. This is given by d d star plus d star d, where d star is that joint to the drawn differential. So d star lowers the degree of the form, d increases the degree of the form. So the Hodge Laplacian preserves the degree of the form. And an easy consequence of definitions. So whenever you have such a combination, operator times its adjoint plus adjoint times the operator, you can show that this operator is non-negative. So this only works for, uh, for closed manifolds. Okay, so now I can write down the action for a free scalar field. Um, in the following way, I'll just get the signs right. Um, so this action is going to be minus one half integral d phi wedge star d phi minus m squared phi squared times the, uh, the boiling form. I can't really write this. Um, let's say like this. So here, the space of fields is just the space of maps from M into R. And phi is the coordinate on the space of maps. OK, now the claim is that if the mass, if this term mass squared is actually positive, Uh, then this theory is equivalent to the, to the trivial theory. So how do you define the trivial theory? So what's the space of fields in the trivial theory and what's the action functional of the trivial theory? Um, so, so empty manifold doesn't have functions on it. Uh, you just need, yeah, um, so, sorry. So point maybe? Empty manifold, oh, yes, yeah, so let's just say a point. Um, so, so a point, so the space of fields will be a point and the action functional is the zero action functional. So that's the claim. Um, yeah, let me, let me take it back. So the empty manifold has functions, but let's not call it the trivial theory. Let's call it the trivial theory where the space of fields is the point, and action functional is just zero. Okay, and the proof is easy uh, as before. Well, you just rewrite the action functional as minus one half. So by integrating by parts, I can move this d um, to the right, and I claim that action, I can actually write this action functional in the following way. So it's integral of phi delta plus m squared acting on phi. So this is again a function multiplied by another function phi and then integrated over the volume form, with respect to the volume form. Well, and now um, from, this, from this claim that uh, the Hodge Laplacian is uh, non negative and the fact that m squared is positive, you get that delta plus m squared is positive, so it has no zero eigenvalues, and therefore this quadratic form is not degenerate. So 
So again, applying the transformation G1, you get that this theory is equal to the trivial theory. For when, you have, uh, when you have the zero mass, then the theory reduces to just somehow what's known as the theory of zero modes, um, the kernel of the Laplacian. Okay, now, so far, these are very similar examples and look pretty obvious. Let me give a very non-obvious example. And this is known as T-duality. Okay, so in this case, you look at um, sigma being some closed Riemann surface. And you look at the free scalar field, on, uh, sorry, you look at the scalar field on sigma, which is periodic. So it's mass from sigma into S1. So you have some field phi. And the action you write down is minus r squared integral d phi wedge star d phi integral over m. So r squared, so r is the radius of the circle. Okay, and the claim uh, that I'll derive is that, um, let me maybe state as a theorem. So the theory, yep. Are there any more claims? Uh, not in this room, unfortunately. Uh, maybe there are some. So, so the theorem is that the theory uh, with the radius r is equivalent to the same theory uh, with the radius 2 pi over r. So this is a very non-trivial statement. You have very different action functionals. So the coefficient is r squared or two pi over r. Sorry, uh, for this theory, it's gonna be four pi squared or r squared. And the claim is that those two are equivalent. Okay. So I'll try the red. Uh, let me know if this doesn't work. Okay, so before I, before I prove this statement, uh, let me remind you some, some classical statement from differential geometry, which is called the Hodgson decomposition. So this is true more generally for compact, uh, so for closed Riemannian manifolds, but um, I'll just use it for a sigma. So you can decompose differential forms on sigma. Let's call, let's say you look at k differential, uh, k forms. You can decompose them into exact forms. Then you can split off something known as co-exact forms. So the image of d star and then harmonic forms. So 
harmonic forms are just forms, K forms, which are annihilated by Laplacian. They're called harmonic forms. It's also easy to see that harmonic forms are closed. And in fact, harmonic forms give you representatives for cohomology. Okay, so this is the first statement and a slight variant of that is that you have decomposition of closed uh, differential forms Um, into the same but without coexact forms. Image of D and harmonic forms. Okay. Uh, this is just because uh, if, if you have a form which is closed and which is coexact, then it's actually zero. All right. So, um, okay, let, let me start working on this action functional that I just raised. Um, okay. Okay, so, so let me, uh, I'm going to look at the case k equals to one. So in this case, the first cohomology of sigma is r to the two g where G is the genus. So I can, I can choose representatives for cohomology. I'll call them omega one through omega two G, two G. And I'll, I'll assume that they're integral. So they're integral harmonic forms. So they're represent, representatives for integral cohomology of, of sigma. Okay, and um, I also have the intersection pairing. So if you wedge two one forms, you get a two form, you can integrate this over sigma. You get some matrix, and by Pancre duality, this matrix is, so this is called intersection pairing. By Pemcray duality, this matrix is non degenerate. So this is integral non degenerate pairing. Okay. Um, so I started with this action functional d phi wedge star d phi. Let me enlarge the space of fields by adding an extra field. So F2 is going to be F1. So F1 was just maps from sigma into S1. And then I'll add just one forms on sigma. Let's say I have some B. And then the action functional here is going to be the following, minus four pi squared over r squared, integral b wedge star b, plus two pi integral b wedge, I think there's an i here, b wedge d phi. Um, okay, so, so I've written, so I started with this theory of just single scalar field with this action functional, and here I 
throw down a different theory. And the claim is that these two theories uh, with this action functional and with this action functional are just equivalent. D1. Okay, so let's uh, let's try to understand this. Well, um, this expression is uh, it has a quadratic term in B, and then a linear term in B. So you can try to complete the square, exactly like we did in classical mechanics. And the claim is that you can complete the square in the following way. You have S2, which is the original action functional, plus integral over sigma, the norm of I, 2 pi B over R, minus star D phi squared uh, D ball M. Okay, so you have this expression. Um, th this should be more or less obvious. If you, if you look at, the, so you can expand this square. You'll have a square of this term. This is going to give you, because of the i, it will give you minus four pi squared norm of b squared over r squared. That's exactly this term. Then there's going to be a mixed term, which will have b and then wedge t phi. That's this term. And then there's going to be a square of d phi, which will cancel with this one. Okay, so that, that should be clear. And again, you can just shift, you can shift b. Um, so this is going to be r or 2 pi i star d phi. And then this is just something that is independent of phi. So the last term is independent of phi. It depends on the B prime. So you can integrate this. Okay, so now I've started with this action functional. I've arrived at this kind of action functional. So this looks, this looks good. So you have a one form, which star of this one form, and the coefficient is exactly like I wanted. But you have this extra term, and you don't know that this one form is actually closed. So you don't know that this is actually d phi, where phi is some map from sigma into S1. So the next step will be to integrate over this last term, because phi is just a map from sigma into S1. So d phi, even though it's not exact, it's closed, so I can apply the Hodge decomposition to that form. And you can write this as d phi naught, so this is an exact part, plus some sum or nj omega j. So here, phi naught is just a function from sigma into r this time, and then nj are some integers. Okay. So here, again, I just applied the Hodge decomposition to this closed one form, and I've written as, a, as an exact one form. So exact one form means it's d of some function into r. This was not exact, but it's, it's a function into S1. And then you have some integral periods. So this is sum of nj omega j. Okay, so now let's just substitute this expression into the last term. So the last term becomes uh, two pi i integral of v wedge d phi naught 
plus the sum of nj omega j. And again, I'll, I'll, let me further restrict to just the, the very first part of this last term. So you have two pi i sigma b wedge d phi naught. Now I can integrate these by parts. Um, so b is of one form. So when you integrate by parts, there is no sign. It's just two pi i db wedge phi naught or times phi naught. Okay, and now I'm going to apply transformation d2. So this term is the only term that has phi naught and it's linear in phi naught. So this, this term two by i db times phi naught is linear in phi naught. So you can replace this theory F2S2 by the theory where you set B to be a closed one form. So you get rid of phi naught and set GB to be zero. Okay, so th this looks better. You start with an arbitrary form and you have this b wedge star, um, star b. So here I, I said that this form is exact. The only thing I need to show is that this form is actually, actually has integral periods to conclude that it's d of some map from sigma into S1. Okay, and for that we, we have the, these uh, extra terms. So let's analyze that. Okay, now B is closed. Let me switch again. So again, I can apply Hodge decomposition and I'll write this D theta naught plus harmonic part. So the, again, theta naught is a map from sigma into R. So this is the exact part. And then you have some harmonic part. So here in the harmonic part, you just have an arbitrary real numbers. Okay. So now let's, um, let's take this expression and let's substitute this into into this B wedge and J omega J. Okay, so you have this exact term, D theta naught times this. This is going to be zero. So the only term that will appear is this uh, term involving aj and nj. So this term is going to be the sum over j and k and j a k integral omega j omega k. There's a two pi i, there's a two pi i here. Okay, so now the intersection form by Pancrea duality, it's non-degenerate. So um, I can apply D3 to this statement. So I have this term, I can apply D3 transformation. So D3 allows me to get rid of the NJs and it allows me to set AK times J to the JK.
and then you set a j a k j to the j k to be an integer. But now since j is um, is non degenerate and it's an integral form, that implies that a k is also an integer. Okay, so to conclude, um, what happened? So using the sequence of transformations, D1, then D2, and D3, I've shown you that this theory described by F1 and S1, so recall that S1 is just this minus R squared integral d phi wedge star d phi is equivalent to the theory I'll call F3 and S3. So F3 is just going to describe this field B so B is going to be a one form, which is closed. And this computation shows that it has integral periods. And S3 is the rest of the action functional. It's minus four pi squared over R squared B wedge star B. Okay, now you just return to the beginning. I, I said that d phi, so d of a map from a sigma into S1, can be written in exactly the same way where, where the, these are integral periods. So what this means is that you can identify this with maps from sigma into S1. Let's call it theta. And then the action functional and the map is taking theta to b being d theta. So the action functional becomes minus four pi squared over r squared integral d theta star d theta. And again, theta here is a map from sigma into S1. Okay, so, so this shows you that the action functional for phi, where you have r squared here is equivalent to the same action functional for some other variable theta, where you have four pi squared over r squared. So this is t-duality. Um, so this is a very non-trivial example. And uh, let me just finish this lecture by saying what else you can do with this uh, notion of duality. Okay, so here I was looking at the case where my space time is just a closed three-dimensional surface, so something two-dimensional. You can ask if you repeat the same computation in three dimensions. So here's, what's ha uh, here's what happened here. If you go through, through the computation, you see that B is up to a factor star G phi. And if you're in two dimensions, then phi is a scalar, G phi is a one form, star G phi is also one form. So B is, a, again, a one form. So then in here, the dual of, of phi, the dual of a scalar field, what you discover is that this is actually not going to be a scalar field again. This is going to be a two form. Uh, which is D so, so which is a curvature of some connection.
on a small bundle. So in this way, you see that the theory uh, for a scalar field in three dimensions is equivalent to Young-Mills theory. So this is Young-Mills theory. Something even more interesting is the eraser. By the dual, I mean, when you do the same computation, you, 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 you again, say, say that you have this B, which is up to some coefficient star G phi, and then you do, you do the, this computation, and in three dimensions, star G phi is going to be a two-form. And then this fact about integral periods will tell you that it's a two-form with integral periods, so it's a curvature of an, a Swan bundle with a connection. And then in four dimensions, Uh, what you see is that the theory, um, I'll just write it schematically, for a coupling constant one over g squared, so Yang and Mills theory, or relative dynamics, is equivalent to the same theory uh, where we have four pi squared g squared. This is uh, Young Mills for the group being S1. And this is an instance of electromagnetic duality. So this on the classical level, this replaces this curvature by star of the curvature. So in four dimensions, if you have a two-form, Hodge dual of that is also a two-form. Now, if you have a curvature, it's closed. But if you have a classical solution of the Yang-Mills equations, then its star is, is also closed. So therefore, you can just replace f by star f formally, and you get um, the same kind of equations. And, and the claim is that this actually arises from this kind of duality between the theories. So this is called as duality or electromagnetic duality. And there are very interesting generalizations of this electromagnetic duality to the case where the group is not abelian. That's related to very interesting mathematics. But okay, I'll stop here. <laughs>